Um, welcome, thank you for coming. And we're going to be talking about Ibernate and Connector J. We're going to be doing some performance considerations. My name is Marcos Obey, I work at Percona. I am a support engineer. Uh, he is Ryan Lowy, he works at Square. He's a production engineer. And we have an in absentia person, which is Fernando Ipar, and he helped us prepare the talk. Um, so well, let's start. Uh, here's our agenda for today. We're going to be discussing why and when to use ORMs. We're going to give a very brief review about Ibernate, and then uh, discuss some considerations about Ibernate and Connector J performance. So, uh, how many of you already use Ibernate and Connector J? So, that's nice. And how many of you have performance issues? There you go. <laughs> okay, so I hope it's, this is going to be a good talk for you. Um, so, <clears throat> what is an ORM? It's an object relational mapping. And why do we need, uh, why do we need an object relational mapping? Because <clears throat> Databases and object-oriented languages have what is called an impedance mismatch. This is your objects don't map one-to-one -to, -one to one table, and the fields in your objects don't map one-to-one -to, -one to your fields in the tables. So you need something that has the intrinsic knowledge of your object and that can map it to the different tables and fields that correspond in the database. And always that you're using an object-oriented language, you're actually, and, connect, and using a database from the object-oriented language, you're actually always mapping your fields and your objects to different fields and tables in the database. You might not be using a library for it, but you're actually doing the mapping somehow. So, uh, Ibernate is just one tool for doing it. And when do you want to do this? When, you, when using an ORM makes sense when you have a rich object domain and doing the manual mapping might become tedious. So the ORMs are there to help you make your life easier. So Ibernate. As again, Ibernate is one of many ORMs available for Java. It's by far the most popular and it has a very rich feature set. So that's why we choose it for discussion. We always see it in production, so we know it's solid. And the key elements of Ibernate are the persistent objects, the configuration, and, well, the database, of course. And Ibernate supports um, what is called reverse engineer. So uh, given a database uh, schema, it will help you create the objects needed to work with that database schema. And, well, it will also help you in the task of managing transactions, connection pooling, uh, naming, normalization, and a lot of other things. So, it will make your life easier, basically. <clears throat> so, what are persistent objects? Those are the objects in your domain. Those are, and especially those objects that are not containing calculated data, or that are not purely calculated data. It's uh, like it follows the same rules that in the database. You don't store uh, data that can be calculated afterwards. And the persistent objects are um, mapped to the database through XML mapping files. And with Ibernate 4, you can use annotations to declare the mapping. But still, the most popular way to do it is with XML mapping files. And Configuration is, uh, is divided into properties for general configuration, connection, uh, connection pooling, logging, and then the XML mapping uh, does two things. It first indicates how your objects translate to database and also hints Ibernate on how to fetch, to retrieve the data from the database. There's more than one strategy to do that and we're going to be reviewing that, and that is also declared in the mapping files. 
Um, and there's also Hibernate 4, which was recently released a few months ago. We haven't seen it in production too much yet, but um, the one thing we know is that the considerations about performance we do for Hibernate 3.6, which is what we use it for this presentation, uh, also apply pretty much to Hibernate 4. So uh, the highlights for Hibernate 4 is that it's based on JDBC 4. It supports multi-tenancy databases, and it got a generous re-architecture effort with a lot of code cleanup and performance improvements, especially in the session object, which is very important for Hibernate, as you already know. And it also got uh, improved logging with international station support. <coughs> so, performance. Uh, again, for this talk, we will be assuming uh, Hibernate 3 ticks. If, if you're using something below, uh, we highly recommend moving to at least 3. But um, all these considerations apply to 3 and above. And also, again, we know we, they apply pretty much to 4, 0 as far as and uh, fetch strategies is going to be the main consideration for Ibernate performance. And laziness is also something that can provide very good gains in terms of uh, memory and uh, other performance uh, adjustments. So, one thing, one thing that um, is good is that they have to change the choice between two strategies uh, to retrieve the data from the database. The first strategy is um, select. And select will <coughs> say you have two related tables. So you fetch uh, 10 IDs from this one table and then to retrieve the related tuples from the next table, it will be issuing 10 different queries. That's what is called the n plus 1 select if problem. But that said, that even when that might not, be, might not seem very efficient, it actually can have its uses. When you have um, a large result set on the primary table, and you only want a subset from the secondary table, then you will want to use select. Because otherwise, using the join strategy, which will result in a single query, you might be fetching unnecessary rows, taking unnecessary memory, and using unnecessary bandwidth in the network, read operations, and what have you, all that comes associated with large data set. If you're not going to use the full data set, you want to cut down that and only retrieve a few rows, the selected strategy is the way. The join strategy, of course, will issue a single query, which lowers uh, latency and, and might be more efficient in most cases. But again, when you only want a partial part, a partial of the secondary set, select is the way to go. So we're going to see uh, some two examples uh, of select and join in action. Here's the first one. It's a very simple query. And we create a criteria uh, for the CD table. We add a restriction, an equity restriction with CD equals sign veil, and we fetch a unique result. And then when we print, we call get country. And well, you see this results in two queries. The first one uh, will be fetching from CD and have the equity in the word. And uh, the second one will be fetching from country, and the equity will be based on the mapping file that uh, we have declared for Ibernate to relate those two tables. <laughs> so that's, that's the result of the select strategy. Now, here's the same query, but you can see we added set fetch mode for the table country, and we declared the fetch mode join. And we did the same, the rest is the same, and we see the query, those two queries are now only one, and the query is inner joining the city and the country table, and the where is based on the equity restriction we added. So this is more efficient, 
issuing only one query for these cases is the most efficient decision. So in your mapping files for these cases, you always want to declare join strategy. Then here's another example where we are going to retrieve a list of cities and we're going to retrieve 10 of those and then we're going to iterate over and we're going to run the same print and get country and this will result in a one query with a limit 10 and then the second query will be repeated n times this is going to be 10 times so in total we're going to have 11 queries this is really non-efficient unless again you only wanted two of the countries and you know you're going to stop your iterations after two then it should be okay. But the join strategy here is very, very efficient, you can see. We, this is the same code except for the one line where we set the fetch mode again, and it will result in the same inner join with a limit 10, and this will bring all the uh, 10 records in a single query. This is really, really more efficient. This is, this is going to be giving you considerable savings in uh, bandwidth and latency. This is like a critical thing if, you're an, if you have an active box and active database. You really want to be careful with this kind of things. <clears throat> so aggregate criteria, it does have some pitfalls. And one important one is, if you go to the previous slide, we can see that we actually, we actually were using only the city field and the country name field, but we actually retrieved tons of fields. We retrieved all the fields that the criteria based on city class could know about it. So select a star or select too many fields is really an evil thing. And the reason that this is evil, first is you're breaking the contract between the application and the database. You're giving the application more fields than, the, that, <coughs> sorry, than those that the application expects. If the application expected three fields, you should be feeding the application only those three fields. If the application expected 10 fields, then you have to give 10 fields, not 11 or 9, but the 10 that it expects. And then <coughs> size, the, the size of the result set really matters. That's also all about memory allocation, I.O. operations to retrieve the, the extra columns we're not using, the objects we have to instantiate to hold the data, and everything that comes associated with extra data that we're not going to use. So you can figure that this also can have a large impact. And select the star is also dangerous if your application relies on the, or on the order of fields in the result set, select star doesn't warranty the order of the fields will be always the same. So if your application for some reason relies on the order, select star might break it eventually. And the most important consideration maybe is that select star or select too many fields will take away the ability to use property indexes and clustered indexes. And we're going to see an example of how much performance impact that can have. So to avoid the select star or select too many fields issue, Ibernet provides projections. Projections are a way to limit the amount of fields on the select or to project aggregate functions over those fields. And here's an example of this uh, simple query without the projection and we can see the same we got a select with lots of fields but we're only using the city name one single field and below the query we, that was generated by the code we can see the explain and we can see it's using an, a key which is index city and that is retrieving only one row it's a very efficient uh, query plan but still if we compare to this one where we have <coughs> added a line that sets projection and we create a projection with the property city and the rest is exactly the same. This results in a query that has only one field and the query plan changes a little bit. The keys are still the same, the amount of rows is still the same, 
But you can notice this one says using where, using index. Let me show you the previous one, has only using where. What does the using index mean? That's what is called a covering index. In this case, <coughs> the two queries look pretty much the same, but when we run a test, like we created a 5 million rows table with an out increment ID and two columns, two integral columns, column A and column B, and indexed only one of those columns, which was column A, and we can see the results. The select column B from my large test fetched five point some million rows in 10 seconds, and the query use fetching the only the indexed column fetched the same five million rows in only two seconds. That's a five times improvement. So why is that? Because MySQL is not reading data from the table. It's already using the index to know which records, but it's also retrieving the data from the index because all the data we need to, to return, it's already found on the index. This can be done for multi-column indexes too. And if all your fields are covered in the index, then you're really getting the same performance gains. And we, even when we don't recommend to, uh, we don't recommend to offer index, like don't do this for all your queries because you will end up with a bloat of index that house, the housekeeping for those indexes when you update, insert, delete, whatever, it, it will have a cost, it will have a performance impact to maintain the index too. But the gains are clearly very good, like for queries that run too many times and that return a result set that is reasonable to keep in an index, then you might want to see, you might want to implement this in your application. <clears throat> okay. Moving on to other topic, uh, collection clearing. I believe um, when you clear, when you have to clear a collection, there are several options. If you are clear, if you are clearing the whole collection for a set or a bag, it will issue a single delete statement. If you want to clear a partial part of a bag collection, it will issue a single delete statement. But for a partial set. Clear. If, you're, if you try to clear a partial set, it will issue as many uh, statements, delayed statements as uh, items you have in that collection. So, you, for very large collections, there's one trick that might or might not be possible in your setup. It depends on your data and on your schema. But if, if you have, say, a thousand items collection, and you only want to keep two of those items. What you might want to do is to uh, temporarily put the two items you want to save in another uh, list, clear the whole collection with those two items included, that will result in a single delete statement, and then you reinsert those two records. Might not be possible to delete and reinsert in your specific data schema, but if it's possible and you really have very large collections to clear, you might want to consider it. And also single delete statements won't be possible if association it, if you have a list with association and it's mapped with inverse equals true. So there it, you won't be able to, uh, it, it will, Ibernate won't be able to use a single delete. It will have to go item over item. <clears throat> and well, obviously issuing as many delets as you have items, it, it has performance implications. Okay, then laziness. Laziness refers to the ability of Ibernate to only retrieve the data from the database when you're really accessing the data. <clears throat> this is, you will have the object instantiated, but it won't have the data inside. It will only be retrieved at the moment of usage. And for collections, it's obviously uh, the best option to make them lazy. And this is the default in Ibernate 3 and above. And when you need them non-lazy, you can sit, switch at runtime and have the collection fill it up beforehand before using it. And, but having too many non-lazy collections can uh, result in sometimes having a very large portion of your data set in memory. And you most likely won't be using the full 
amount of data you have in memory. So if you have, again, if you have many concurrent users, you might end up having memory uh, uh, problems, memory starvation problems. And that's for, lazy, for row retrieval laziness. And then it's column retrieval laziness. This is, uh, Admit could all, can also detect which columns are used and only retrieve those. But uh, it's, it, it's cumbersome to implement with the laziness features, and it's much easier to use the projections we saw before to implement this. And well, it also supports path fetching, which uh, when you have, say, you want to retrieve 25 rows, but you want to retrieve at, uh, in batches of 10, Ibernate does the right thing of only retrieving 10 rows at a time and displaying those 10 rows. Other ORMs, what will do it will, they will fetch the whole 30, 25 rows and only display 10 of those and make accessible 10 of those, so, which is quite bad. Uh, this, this will save you sometimes on, like when you are paginating over a collection, and well, it will save you from fetching all the, all the tuples unnecessarily. Okay, uh, concurrency. So, in databases, uh, you want to keep your transactions as short as possible to avoid causing contention and locking, and also to avoid having uh, unnecessarily large uh, undo, undo slots in your, in your IDB. So, what happens is there, there are certain situations like a shopping cart where you cannot have uh, short transactions. You will begin a transaction and you will be waiting for user input. So what happens is that the transaction becomes incredibly long and you might be logging some records that other people want to use. So the thing is what uh, Ibernet does is it keeps the transaction in memory and will keep a version of the data you retrieve at the moment of starting the transaction. And when, the trans when your user finishes and says, check out, and it, the transaction is to be committed, there it will check if the version of the data in the, in the database is still the same as the one you had when you started the transaction. And if it is, it will commit. Otherwise, it will run the in-memory transaction. So that's what is called optimistic concurrency control. It doesn't lock anything and it's optimistic about no one else going to be using that data while the tr long transaction is going on. So this is a consideration of the performance towards uh, transactions. Now, moving to connector J. So here is the stack. All of you know how it works. Your application talks to Ibernate, and Ibernate does not talk to the database directly, but it talks to the connector J, which in turn speaks with MySQL. And so connector J, it's in the middle of your performance issues most of the times. So when we start a performance of lead engagement, and we, we can quickly say if connector J is behind, because we will see tons and tons of administrative comments, set, show, and select, which are only uh, there to be compliant 100% with the JDBC protocol. And those can go away and you will still have a perfectly stable and perfectly solid database that you can trust as much as you can trust the JDBC. Uh, by complying with the JDBC protocol, but without the pain of the performance. So, Connector J tries that, to be 100% compliant with the uh, JDBC specification. And, but it brings included in Bundlet with Connector J, there are a uh, few config files, and one of them provide, in a, using one of them with a simple uh, parameter in your, your connection URL will give very good means with very little risk as long as you have everything configured properly. And one all, as always, use the latest stable version that will always bring the latest features and be supported for the longer term if you can. So 
as, as much as you can stay up to date. <clears throat> so, again, what we see when we, when we, when we see is tons of extra queries. These queries, uh, what I'm doing is setting the auto commit, setting the transaction isolation, and they are really uh, like it, it does set auto commit equals one, runs your query, and this, then does set auto commit equals one again. Just it wraps the calls, each query, with a set auto commit. And so if you have that setting properly in both your database and then you do connection set transaction auto commit uh, to true, you don't have to worry about, you don't have to have a connector J doing it. You know you did it right once, you can disable this and know everything will be fine, which is what most other software in the world does. And so those four are related to that, to set auto commit and to the set transaction isolation queries that are useless. And then uh, the other big gain in connector J, the other major gain came from being able to reduce the latency. So connector J is quite smart at this when it detects that it's your use issuing several insert statements and it detects that those uh, statements can be uh, rewritten as only one multi-row insert. It will transform after it detects three of them. It will collect them all and just rewrite as a batch insert. And <coughs> other good gain comes from using cache prepared statements and cache um, runnable statements. And those will cache the parsing stage for prepared statements and for functions and story procedures and will save latency since each call to those will be saving time and it will be faster. Yes? On the rewrite batch statements, does it keep the order of inserts? Isn't that? Uh, yes, yes, it, it, it will follow the top down order. As, as I understand, yes. I, he, we are, we always see this from the database perspective. So, I know Connector J up to where performance comes. I, I'm most sure it does. I'm most sure it does because otherwise it will be, it wouldn't be, uh, it doesn't make sense to, it wouldn't make sense to change the, the statement order and it would, there wouldn't be any reason. And since he is running top down and uh, re rewriting top down, it, it will probably allocate all these all the rows it will insert in the same order you expected them to be. So the downside of doing this though is that you lose the ability to do things with the last insert ID, oh. right? So it's going to batch them all up. It will do it in order, but you'll you know if you want it to do something else with it after, then you lose that ability. So it depends on your application. <coughs> okay. Cache result set metadata. It does what it says it does. It will uh, keep a local version of, um, it will retrieve the metadata about a result set once, and if you have another result set that it, it's, it uses the same, uh, fetch it from the same tables, but for different uh, IDs or uh, tuples, it, will, it won't have to refetch the metadata about that result set and that provides a significant save. So this is a uh, per query type. So if your application has 200 different queries, you want to set the caches, this cache size to something like 200. Sometimes if your application has 10,000 queries, you can set it to that large. So what you do is you can go through your slow query logs or full query log and analyze it with a, a tool like PT Query Digest and get a report sorted by uh, the number of times a query is executed, a certain type of query is executed. And that will uh, give you, an, then you can say, okay, I have these queries which are the ones that run the most, are, I don't know, 50 queries will take up 95% of the executions against my database. 
So that 50 or 100 will be plenty enough, even if you have 10,000 different words, because the other 9,900 are not running so often. So fetching the, cache, the metadata about that result set, it's OK once in a while. Then maintain time stats. Uh, when you set maintain time stats to true, which is the default, uh, Connector J will keep, uh, will run two system calls to get micro time before and after the query to have uh, timing information in the errors, in, in the error messages. Uh, so you're training off a little bit of EC of use because sometimes it's nice to, to, to have the timing information in the error messages for about a 3% for a good gain, which is roughly uh, the gain this could give you on a busy box. So maintain time stats false will get rid of those two system calls and will provide a decent gain. Don't track open resources. So uh, I don't know if, if happens to in your applications, but we see lots of Java applications that don't close connections properly. They just leave the connection there and nobody calls close connection and there are no destructors close, uh, closing the connection. And what happens is that connector J has to chase down these connections to keep them and to finally close them. The problem is that it can become very expensive in memory, in terms of memory usage. So, again, in busy steps, you want to disable this and uh, save a lot of memory. It, it, will, it does provide a very large memory difference. There's one uh, problem with this. By default, MySQL uses, has a timeout for connections of 20, 28,000 seconds. So, your connections will remain open in the database for 28,000 seconds. So you have to go to MySQL and lower the timeouts for connections. Otherwise, you will run out of connections very soon. There's another parameter over here that you can, uh, if I remember right, to, you can set and then uh, say, OK, the database uh, timeout is 28 something, and you can set it to, I read it once, you can set it to half a ton, like 14,000 or 400 or something. In, in the database. Yes, yes, that's what I'm trying to say. That you should, if you disable, don't track open resources, it will save your memory. But on MySQL, connections will remain open and you will run out of connection slots. So what you can do is lower the timeouts on the MySQL side. And so after a few seconds, connections will close automatically if they are idle. So that's the way to, is that what, that was your question? Yeah. And, but anyway, it's always a better idea to correct your application and close, and call connection close at the end of the execution. Okay. <clears throat> so here is the Batlet config file we were talking about earlier. It's called Max Performance, and I had the wrong name. There is Max Performance or Solaris Max Performance, not Max Performance Solaris. I apologize for that. And this will set most of what we saw before, plus um, cache server configuration. That will save us from two extra queries, show uh, variables and show collatium. And it will also uh, disable query timeouts. And query timeouts, it's funny. Connector J <coughs> uses a shared uh, timer, um, util timer instance to keep a timeout for each query it executes. But even if the query executes in, say, one millisecond, the timeout of 30 seconds will remain in the, in the timer object. So say your, let's say your timeout is of 30 seconds and you run 1,000 queries per second. By the end of the 30 seconds, you will have 30,000 timers uh, 20,000, uh, 30,000 timeouts in the timer object. And all your queries will be done a long time ago. 
<laughs> but the objects will the object will still hold all the ten rounds. So that can also be a memory issue. And actually, if you control the the running time of your queries, and you you can actually, actually well, it will work if if your um, how would how would it work? You will need to keep control of yourself and set up timers yourself, and use the same. You could use the same shared timer instance, but by your, on your own code. You don't rely on the connector J, and you need to clear the timeouts yourself. That would be the right way to circumvent if you really want to have uh, automatic timeout of your queries. It won't be automatic. You will be handling, but you will have a timeout in case you have long-running queries you, you want to kill. Well, and here's how much gain it can provide. We're going to see uh, two different examples. The first one, we produced a uh, synthetic load with a full table scan on a 2,000 rows table. And we had this query running uh, 200 times from 1,000 different connections. And you can see the select itself ran 20,000 times and took 95% of the time. And then show variables and show palladium took another 4 point. And, and along with the set, it took 4.5% of the time. If you had 100 servers, that will be almost 4.5 servers you're saving. You could be saving. It doesn't mean too much, but it's a decent amount. Now, when that's running with a normal connection URL, when we add use configs equal max performance to the URL, here's what we get. We see the select is now using 99%, 99.7% of the time. And the, the set, the show, is almost gone, it runs only once, and the set takes only 0.3% of the time. That's quite a good improvement. And, well, the next example will show even a better improvement. Here's what happens. We kept the same table and the same full table, the full table scan and run the, the query only three times from each, each connection, but this time with 50,000 connections. And what happens is the show variables and show collation now run 50,000 times and take up to 21% of the time of execution time. That's 20 servers in our 100 server setup. That's 20 servers you're saving. You're really paying your salary with that. And with max performance, we will see this really went away and the select is again taking the vast majority of execution time and the only ones that remain executing once per connection is the set and they take only 1.5% 1, 1, 1 of the time. So that's really a substantial gain and it's really safe to use max, config, max performance config file. It, it's recommended by Mark M, which is the, the head developer for Connector J. He, he says it's totally safe as long as you care about setting the proper configuration in the, in the server and as long as you set the proper um, isolation level and, and auto commit mode when you start the, the connection. So as long as you do that, you are perfectly safe using this and it will provide very substantial gains, as you can see. So uh, that was it. I think we still have a few minutes left if anyone wants to make any questions. Then, thank you for everything. Thank you for attending. <laughs>